part two today of thinking right about the church. Thinking right about the church. Today I'm afraid that there's so much poor thinking or wrong thinking about the church that we need to take a look in God's word and to see what God says is right about thinking about his church. And the reason why I think so many are struggling with that today, of thinking right about the church, is because it's not being presented right. And uh, we've gone way to the other side of the pendulum today, and and we're displaying and giving an image of the church that I think really is, uh, in much cases, is contrary to the Word of God. And I say that because God says in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, that He says, My ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not yours. Period. He said, matter of fact, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts higher than yours. And the Bible says in the book of Judges chapter 25, in the last verse, what had happened with the nation of Israel, they got to a place there that they'd, every man did that what was right in his own eyes. And we're seeing that today. Everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. On Wednesday nights, we've been learning about honoring God and God's word and putting a great worth of value and worth to it and weight to it and honoring it and obeying it and believing it. And we're finding out that uh, it's God's word, not my word. It's God's way, not my way. It's God's method, not my method. It's God's plan, not my plan. It's God's uh, uh, program, not mine. You see, God's laid it all out here, ladies and gentlemen, in his book called The Bible. And if we just get into it, we'd find out the mind and heart and mind of God and the mind of Christ, and then we wouldn't have any problem. The Bible says to bring every, now this is one that really gets me, and it may get you. The Bible says that I'm to bring every thought. Now I want you to think about that. How many thoughts did you have today already? Probably thousands. I'm to bring every thought into the captivity of Christ. Every thought. Well, that's a -a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week, full-time job, isn't it, Robert? To bring every thought into the captivity of Christ. But when I do, then I'm going to have the mind of Christ. Then I will know the words of Christ. I will know the ways of Christ. And I won't have a problem. But today, I think it's gotten different. And so just by way of review, before we get into our message this morning, part two of thinking right about the church, uh, we're taking a survey through 1 Timothy. The book of 1 Timothy has six chapters, and it's written by the Apostle Paul to young Timothy, who happens to be pastoring the church at Ephesus at this time, a church that Paul founded and started and spent three years of his life there uh, working and establishing that church in Ephesus. And now he's called young Timothy to take that work over, and he's there. And Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives young Timothy some inspiration. He gives him some instructions. He gives him some guidelines. He gives him some exhortation. He gives him some warnings. He gives them some commands. I mean, he gives him a lot. And says, and says, by the way, we call First and Second Timothy and Titus the pastoral epistles. They are epistles written to pastors, Timothy and Titus. And, and God's blueprint, his instructions. And he says, Timothy, here's what I want you to teach your people, your congregation there at Ephesus. I want you to get them to think and write about the church and how the church ought to function and operate and so forth. So that's what he does. And so when we came to chapter 1, we learned that in chapter 1, as we picked out some key things there, that that, that we are a body that is healthy and balanced. We are a body that is healthy and balanced. And then we looked at three of those things in there. We learned that number one, first of all, our goal was what, church? Love. Amen. And what kind of love are we to have? A pure love. What kind of? A good conscience and a sincere, genuine faith. That's the kind of faith that we're to have. Then what was the core of our message? What is it? The core of the message of the church is the gospel. Not fun and games, not entertainment, not all the wild stuff that's going on and then you name it and claim it and and the the lights and the pyro and the smoke and all that. That's not the core of the church, the message of the core of the church. The message, the core of the church is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And why is that so important, church? Because what? It's a what? Trustworthy statement. Amen? In other words, it is certain. It's something that you can believe. What is? The gospel. And it's deserving of what? Full acceptance. In other words, it's worthy of all recognition, acknowledgement, approval. What is? 
the gospel, you see. Then we discovered the object of our worship. Why do we come here this morning? Who is the object of our worship, church? It's not the preacher. It's not the music leaders and directors. It's not the choir. That's not the object of our worship. It's not the praise singers. It's not the band. Let's see if we had one and had that here. That's not the object of our worship. The object of our worship is the eternal king. That's what it says there in verse number 17, if you're in chapter 1. The eternal king. And Paul says he's eternal, he's invisible, he's immortal, he's the only wise God. Therefore, all honor and glory belong unto the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's our first well-balanced church right there that the apostle gives us. Then as we move into chapter 2. Chapter 2, Paul gives us here that we ought to be a people committed to prayer. We ought to be a people committed to prayer. Now, we're trying to think right about the church. The world has its ways and its thoughts and opinions and given to everybody. But let's look at God's word, what God says is right about the church in thinking. And that is we ought to be committed to prayer. Paul emphasized it right off the bat. He said, first of all, what church? First of all, through prayer. See, the church, why is that so important? Two things we learned in that particular chapter, why prayer is so important. Number one, it ushers us into the very presence of God. When we come to God in prayer, we go immediately into the throne room of glory. We go into the, immediately into the throne room of grace, and we find help in the time of need. You see, and when we pray, it ushers us right into the very presence of God himself. You can have an audience with God this morning with through prayer going right into the throne room. Hallelujah. Then we learn something else through prayer why it's so important. Because not only do we get uh, come into the presence of God, we get plugged into the power of God. Little prayer, little power. Much prayer, much power. No prayer, no power. Hello. So we learned in chapter 2 if we're going to think right about a church, then the church ought to be one that's committed to prayer. We have prayer here. We meet four times a week at this church for prayer. That's not even enough. But at least we have four down. And we praise God for that because it's important. Why? I want to get into the presence of the Lord. And I, by all means, want God's power. Can't do it without it. Amen? Then thirdly, here's a good one. This is, we finished up with this one last week. We are a representation, now watch this, of God's unchanging standards. Today, the modern church has changed the standards because cultures change, the 21st century's changed, the hype, the hip, and everything, and the modern day contemporary progressive cultural church, we have changed our standards. But may I remind you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, God has not changed his standards. See, if you want to think right about the church, you'd better get into the Word of God, and you better get into Timothy here and find out what God says about it, and you can read it. We didn't go through it. We didn't have time. But you see, we got a lot of self-appointed prophets, preachers, uh, apostles, you name it, and uh, claim it, and on down the line, and everything else, and all kinds of uh, qualifications or no qualifications at all to be a preacher. But God hasn't changed His standards. His standards are still the same. They're the same standards that Paul penned 2,000 years ago as they are today right now. Now, you go home and read chapter 3. God hasn't changed his standards in the way we live and act and everything, even though everybody else has, and many of the churches today have changed God's standards. I'd like to spend a lot of deal time on this one, but I don't have time. Okay? But here Paul lists us the qualifications of the leaders and their positions, 1 through 14. And, and then, he, then he says that we, who? Us, the church. We are, to be, we are the church of the living God. We are the pillar and the support of the truth. And then Paul begins to list qualifications. Uh, the final is Jesus Christ himself is the ultimate standard for us to follow. You see, in doing so thou shalt save thyself and them that hear. The apostle Paul tells young Timothy, if we follow God's standards. Ladies and gentlemen, God has not changed his standards. I don't care what the world's done. And it doesn't matter what other churches and pastors and leadership or whatever else or denominations are doing. You see, they're doing what's right in their own eyes. That's what Judges says. They're doing their own thinking, their own thoughts, rather than God's. And that's why everything's changed, and that's why everything's messed up. That's why there's so much confusion. That's why we don't know what's left and what's right anymore. 
We have people come here and visit this church and they think we're weird. I mean, I've had them tell me that. Boy, it's strange over there. It's not like our church. I said, well, how's your church? And then they proceed to tell me and I say, well, you're right. We're different. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Today, young people come in here and they say, man, wow, this is a different church altogether. You guys don't even look like a church. You know why? Because they don't have the right thinking down. They're not thinking right because they're not being taught right. All right, so this morning we're going to pick up here in chapter 4. Chapter 4, as we continue, we are a force for good in bad times. How many believe we're living in bad times? We are a force for good in bad times. Again, that calls for us to be different. Can't be the same, amen? So let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your word. My, how we love your word, God. It is our instructional manual. It's our training guide. Father, it's our inspiration. It's our exhortation. It's our uh, reproof, rebuke. It's our exhortation. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for it. It's awesome. It's our plan. It's our method. Is your word. It's our final authority. And we thank you for the word of God today. Father, now we come uh, humbly before you and ask for your help. Father, we cannot stand and preach in this place apart from your help. From your anointing, your power of your Holy Spirit. Well, Father, as we now come into your presence through prayer, help us to get plugged into your power. Father, I pray that Christ will be lifted up and glorified and magnified. His name, his church today, above all things, that it will draw all men to him. And Lord, if there's one here today, or those that are watching by television, radio, internet, iPads, iPhones, tablets, Facebook, everywhere that we have it out there, God, I pray you'd reach someone for Christ today. And they would get saved. And help those that are struggling with trying to find a right church. And the right thinking about the church through the word of God today. In Jesus name. Amen and amen. Chapter 4. We are a force for good in bad times. Amen. And by the way take a look at that little note we added there. Emphasis here. And if we are not. Then we are a part of the reason why it's bad. Are you listening to me church? We are a force of good in bad times. If we are not that force, then we are a part of the bad times. So let's take a look at it and see what Paul has to give. And first of all, we're going to take a look at some characteristics of bad times. Some characteristics of bad times that we're to be a force in. And I'll draw your attention here. It's in chapter 4, but I also want you to turn over to 2 Timothy, if you would, for just a moment. And read with me in 2 Timothy very quickly. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you would, please. And if you agree with any of this in the Scripture, it's okay to say amen. Praise the Lord. That's right. Hallelujah. It's okay. We don't mind that here. That means you're in agreement with the Scriptures and with this pastor. Know this first. Know this also, that in the last days. How many believe we're living in the last days? I believe we're in the last of the last of the last days. Notice, perilous times, that means exceedingly fierce, is what that phrase means, perilous. Exceedingly fierce times shall come. I want to tell you, they've already come. They've come. For men, now, now what's going to identify that? What's going to be the characteristics of that? And if you agree with any of this, say hello, hello, whatever. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Selfish, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Without natural affection. That's the gay lifestyle. Truce breakers. False accusers. Incontinent. Fierce. Despisers of those that are good. Traitors. Heady. High-minded. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. If there's anything that describes today, that's it right there. Okay? Having a form of godliness. Denying the power thereof from such. What are you to do? Why turn away? Why? For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Boy, there's a good description of last days. Now let's get back to chapter 4 of 1 Timothy. 
And let's take a look at some of the characteristics, some more characteristics. There was a whole slew of them right there for you, but I'm going to give you some for your study notes. And first of all, notice with me, we find the first three right here in verse number one. We find the first three bad characteristics uh, right here in verse number one. Now the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, by the way, speaketh expressly that in the latter times, here we go. How many of you believe we're in the latter times? Okay, here's the first one. Number one, shall depart from the faith. Shall depart from the faith, that is, the, that there is defection. There's going to be a lot of defection going on in the church today. The abandonment of the faith, the turning from the faith, uh, the apostate church, the state of apostasy, that's abandoning and turning from the faith. Matter of fact, look at the second one there. Giving heed to seducing spirits. In other words, giving heed to seducing spirits. Deception. We're describing the characteristics of the last days. There's going to be great deception. Then notice the third one in that verse. And doctrines of devils. Now when you find the word devils there, that means demons. There's only one devil. Come on now. There's only one devil. His name is Lucifer. Satan. Beelzebub. He's got all kinds of names. But when the scripture speaks of devils in the plural, it's speaking of demons. And man, have we got today, people are following the doctrine of demons. Now, if you were to go over to 2 Timothy chapter 4, turn over there with me. little cross-reference there. Put that down by those verses, those three there, and look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 with me. Let's look at a cross-reference to that. Everybody in 2 Timothy 4? Look at verse number 2. Preach the word, be instant, season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and what, church? Doctrine is teaching. Sound biblical doctrine. Now why? For the time will come when they will not endure, that word endure means to bear up under, sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and he's out there in Houston, Texas, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables, myths, or legends. All right, everybody got that? So here we are, Paul's describing to young Timothy that in the latter days, this is going to be the characteristics of bad times. That's why it's so important we have to be a good force in bad times. Let's continue to look at some more bad times back in 1 Timothy, if you would, verse uh, number, chapter 4, and verse number 2. Let's take a look at the uh, third characteristic in bad times. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. In other words, they're going to speak lies in hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Play acting. Pretending. Pretending to be or to know or to have what, what they're not. Boy, there we go. Look at verse number 3. We find two of them here in verse 3. Forbidding to marry. There's, a, there's another one. That's called legalism. Forbidding to marry. Are you with me? Say amen. To abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. How many of you believe this morning? How many of you know the truth this morning? Then you go out and eat it with thanksgiving. Amen? We pray every time we eat, Carolina, before we thank God for the food and ask Him to bless it, we, ask, we tell God we receive this meal with thanksgiving. I don't care if it's a hot dog. I don't care if it's beans and rice or dried cereal. I like dried cereal, by the way. Okay? But we receive it with thanksgiving. I don't care where we're at, where we're restaurant we're at. I may not like it, may not look good, may not smell good, may not be hot. Sometimes it's even cold. And I don't like cold bacon, eggs, and ham, and, and, and pat, pat, flapjacks, you understand? But hey, it doesn't matter. I receive it with thanksgiving, and I give God thanks for it, and ask God to bless it. And it just may taste like steak, or filet mignon, or lobster. Hallelujah. God will make it warm going down. Number three, abstaining from meats there. Sixthly there in your sixth one. Abstaining from meats, that's asceticism. That means self-serve, self-discipline. It means the avoidance of all forms of indulgence and typically for religious reasons. Now, we're in bad times. No doubt about it. And you can go over to 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7. Now, let's take a look in verses 6 through 15. Paul now then says, here's what we need to be. Here's the kind of force we need to be in bad times. What are bad times? Defection, deception, demonism, hypocrisy, legalism, asceticism. Okay, those are bad times. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Those are bad times. And Paul says, now, if we're going to be a, the right church and have the right kind of thinking about a right church, then we need to become a good force in bad times. Let's take a look at the good force that we're to become. And we find that right here, verse number, beginning in verse number 6. First of all, number one, we're to be good servants, nourished on what, church? Faith and sound doctrine. Are you listening to me? That is so important. Sound doctrine. Did you know the word doctrine appears 12 times in these two chapters here in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy? 12 times the word doctrine appears, all in the positive sense, the positive mode uh, concerning the things of God, uh, everything. 12 times sound, biblical, good doctrine. That's teaching, by the way. And the reason why the people today are struggling with trying to believe what is right about the church is because they're not getting sound biblical doctrine. And when they do, we're finding that many of them are abandoning in the faith, turning from the faith, and they're not bearing up under sound doctrine. That's what Timothy said in 2 Timothy chapter 4. For the time will come when they shall not endure, bear up under sound doctrine. That's why he went on and said, listen man, young Timothy, you be watchful, you preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine. And then he says, but watch and do the work of an evangelist. What's the work of an evangelist? He's an announcer of good news that Jesus died to save sinners. Now let's all say that this morning, okay? Here we go. Everybody together. Let's say it. Good news that Jesus died to save sinners. Let's say it again. The good news that Jesus died to save sinners. Every one of you just qualified to be an evangelist. Now go out and evangelize. Go out and tell the world that Jesus died to save sinners. See, we got to be a good force. And now notice, good sir, look at verse 6. Let's read it here, verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these. This is what he's telling Timothy here. Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Are you with me in verse 6? Nourished up in the words of what? Faith and good doctrine. You see, if we're going to be the right kind of church in thinking, we've got to be nourished up in the faith and in good doctrine. Did you notice it didn't say we're to be good servants nourished up on rock and roll? Wild music, lights, strobes, fire, smoke, nightclub, lounges, discos. Boy, it got quiet in here. That's what a lot are being nourished up on today. That's why they don't have right thinking about the church. I'll tell you that right now. Go out on the websites and look at their auditoriums and their scenes that they've created. And I mean, and, 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 and Rick Warren is the big producer of that out there in California at Saddleback. I mean, he read his book and read his thing. He says, man, if you want to build a mega church and you want to have a massive church, he gives everything that you're to take away and everything you're to do. And the first thing he says is get rid of your hymnals. He says, get rid of all your crosses in and on your church and get rid of them and take them down. Because they're an offense. You got that right, Brother Rick. The cross is an offense to them that believe not. But to those of us who believe, it is the power of God unto salvation. Hallelujah. Paint your auditorium black. Bring in the lights, the dancers, the band. If you want to build a mega church, create an atmosphere of a nightclub or a lounge. That's exactly what they're doing. Then we wonder why our young people today wonder, well, man, how can they even think right about the church? Because they're not seeing a right church. Then they come in here and look at this and say, whoa, there's something different here. You got that right. We're to be a good force. We're to nourish the servants of God on faith and sound doctrine. Look at verse 7. Verse 7, he says, but refuse profane old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Number two there, we're to be disciplined. We need to be disciplined disciples whose goal is godliness. Whose goal is to be godliness if we're going to have thought thinking about the church. Number three, exemplary teachers. 
sharing the hope of Christ. That's found in verses 10 through 13 there. He talks about Timothy being a teacher, being a, a serving as a pattern, uh, being a commendable teacher of the Word of God and to share the hope of Christ. That's why 2 Timothy 2, 15 says, What study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, so you can rightly divide or handle the Word of God. We're to be teachers, exemplary teachers. We're to be t- teachers of, of serving as a pattern, as a commendable and serving pattern to those that teach the hope of Christ. What kind of teachers are we to be? 2 Timothy 4, 2. But notice what God said there. Timothy told him. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, when he follows up his second letter here, he says, young man, if you're going to be a, a servant here, a serving as a pattern, as a commendable teacher and a serving teacher, an exemplary teacher, he said, here's what you've got to do, boy. You've got to study. Now listen to me. You need to study. The Bible is very clear that the man of God is to study. You are to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman, that needeth not to be ashamed so that you can rightly divide, handle this book. And it comes by the only way you can do it is by studying it. It doesn't come by direct revelation. And we're to study not for me to be approved, but I'm to study so that God approves me. That's why we're to study. All this direct revelation stuff, folks, is unbiblical and unscriptural. I have all the revelation I'm ever going to have or want to need or got right here in these 66 books. Some 33,000 chapters and some 700 and something thousand words. I got all the revelation I need right here in this book. All I got to do is get it and study it so that God will approve me. Not running around town doing everything, all that going here and there and there, and go home, fall on the couch, get a 20 minute power nap on my way to church. All of a sudden, I'm going to get a direct revelation. Then I'm going to get up and preach you a message, and you're going to shout and stomp and holler and all say how wonderful and great it is. And then that's going to build my head and my ego so big that I think you guys are just wonderful, and you think I'm the greatest preacher that walked the planet of the earth because I got direct revelation. To do a 45-minute message up here takes about 8 to 16 hours of study. Hello. And I have four of them a week. Verse 14. We're to be a force in good times. We're to preach sound doctrine. Number four. Look at here. Those who don't, don't neglect the spiritual gift within you. See, if I'm going to be a good force in bad times, Sunday school class, spiritual gifts. Here we go. Look at here. Neglect not the gift that is in thee. How many of you are with me in our Sunday school class on spiritual gifts? You see, if we're going to be a force church in good times, we can't neglect our spiritual gift, which was given thee by who? By the prophecy which of the laying on of hands of the presby. Are you, are you with me here? So I'm not going to neglect the spiritual gift. Number five, found in verse 15. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that profiting may appear to all. In other words, I'm to cultivate the spiritual gifts that God has given me and given you. Why? We have got to be a force of good in bad times. If the people are going to think right about the church. Really are. Number five. We are a model of compassion with discernment. A model of compassion with discernment. And notice I added with discernment. Some get a little carried away with compassion. Many of those that have the gift of mercy. If God's given you the gift of mercy here, you'll, you'll struggle with the gift of compassion, of being compassionate, because you'll become so compassionate that your gift of mercy will cloud your judgment and will cloud your discernment. Are you with me? You need to have discernment. We just don't go and spend God's money like it's nothing. We're accountable for it. There's accountability. I don't have the, the privilege or the right or anything to just spend money like it's coming out the door and going in the door and out the door. I'm accountable for it. We're to be good stewards and good managers of it. That doesn't mean, and that doesn't mean we don't help people do things. But we're to be a good discerner of that. 
How many have we had here and come? And uh, uh, we used to, over at Bible Baptist, that was one of my responsibilities was taking care of all these people that would come by and knock on the door and want gas and food and money. And, and uh, uh, he would say, they're yours, go get them. And, uh, you know, he'd look out the window and open the blinds. And, and, and I said, okay, great, here we go. And, uh, I mean, the stories that would be told and this and that and, and everything. And then they need this and need that. And so, you, uh, you know, and you just don't give it. You have to have discernment. You need compassion with discernment. They'd come here and they'd ask, and then they'd say, well, I'm, I'm, my tank's full, empty, I need gas to, to get here and get there. And say, so, would, would you buy me some gas? And I'd say, well, okay, uh, we could possibly do that. Uh, can I have the money? No, no, we don't give you cash here. But there's a gas station down here, and I'll drive down there and meet you at the gas station, and we'll put some gas in your car for you if you need it. And I said, follow me to the gas station. I've gone this way, and they've gone that way. I said, well, I guess they didn't need any gas. Then I've had said come, and I said, well, does your gauge on your car work or the truck? Yeah. I said, would you turn the key on for me just a moment? I said, does that, does that gauge work, sir? Yes, it does. I said, well, it says you have a full tank. Well, uh, I said, well, you just told me you needed gas money. Your car was empty. You just lied to me. And I have to hide behind the tree to keep the rocks from hitting me as they're peeling out of the driveway. I had a, a truckload of four ladies drove up and told me they were hungry one day at the office there. They wanted food. And so we're hungry. So they had a camper on the truck. I said, well, okay, well, let's see what we could do for you. I said, first of all now, just let you know. I said, there's no money here at the church. We keep no money here at the church. We absolutely do not. I said, and secondly, I do not write checks. My name's not on anything around this place. I don't handle money. I don't touch it. Don't count it. Don't deposit. I don't, I, I, nothing. My name's not on anything. So I said, so I can't help you there. So whatever I have to do, I have to do it out of my own pocket. And I said, I'll see what I've got, and then, you know, and if I could do something, I'll, I said, I'm willing to drive all the way down to McDonald's. That's 10 miles from here. And I'll buy you all some burgers, whatever you need, if you really, you really need, you need help, you need food. So I, I, I kind of was walking around the truck, and I always like to look in, to see, you know. And here I see groceries piled up in the back, and I see McDonald's bags all over the seat. And I said, uh, ladies, there's looks like you all just had a good lunch here with McDonald's, man. I mean, yet you told me you wanted money for food in the back of your pickups loaded with grocery bags. I said, I think you ladies are trying to pull something on me here. Boy, they got in their car, their truck, cussed me out, and on the way out, they threw all of their McDonald's garbage out the window. Out come fries, out come milkshakes, out come everything. And I said, man, hallelujah, if it wouldn't land in the dirt, I'd have something to eat. See, you need discernment along with compassion. We've had them come here and want us to pay their bills and electric bills and water bills and all that stuff. And the first thing I asked them, well, are you a customer of SECO or who's your electric company? Did they bring the bill? And I look at the dates and try to see, well, man, these things are nine months old. You got something more current? One guy here a, week, a few weeks ago came up, brought a stack of bills this high. And he wanted me to pay all of his bills. And I'd seen they'd been wrapped up and the paper had been worn. And I mean, they'd been using these things a lot. <laughs> so you've got to use discernment. And then those that are legitimate, I get on the telephone. And I say, is this Seiko? Yes, this is Pastor Exile at Westmere Baptist Church. I have a client of yours here, a customer of yours. Here's their name and their account number. And I understand you're going to turn their power off today. Is that correct? And they'll look it up and say, yes, sir, that is correct. I said, okay, what do I need to do to help you to keep that on for them? I said, I, I can't pay the whole thing, but I, what, could, what would you be satisfied with if I could give you something that would keep their electric on for them? And they would tell me, and i say, follow me, and they would come with me, and we go down to Seco there on 60th Airport Road, and I walk in, I hand them the bill, and I pay part of that bill, and they tell them now their electric will be on for another month done that with phone bills, apartment bills. You just don't give God's money away and throw it away. You got to be good stewards of it, good managers of it. Because I'm accountable to him and I'm accountable to you with it. And by the way, I'm only allowed to spend so much here anyway. And I got a limit. And it's a small limit. And if it goes any higher, then there's five men on the board of trustees here. And those five men are responsible from that point on. And they're only limited to spend so much. And then they're cut off. And then after that, it goes before you, and you decide what we spend. 
That's called accountability. And so we can have compassion for people. But the best one that Dr. Woodward and I used to la- have a good time with is that we would see them and here they would come. And he, I'm over here in my office and he got the front office there nicer, bigger, you know, because he's the pastor. And, and he's looking out the blinds. And Mrs. Woodward's over there. And she's watering her plants out there with her hose. So pastor, come here, come here, come here. He says, we on for lunch today? I said, we're on. All right, we're on for lunch. Here was the deal. We were going to decide whether they get her or not. And I said, oh, yeah, they're going to get her. 20 bucks, easy, 20 bucks. He goes, nah, 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 maybe nothing or 10. I said, okay, we'll see. So they'll be talking to Mrs. Woodard. She's there. Pretty soon she lays the hose down. Here she goes. She goes walking in the house. I said, ah, I got it, I got it. And here she come back out. We'd see her head something. Off they'd go. She'd go back to water. He'd open them up wider, bang on the window, and look at her. He'd walk out. How much? 20? Yeah, I got lunch today. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, we had some good times. We need to be discernment. Now, real quickly as you're looking at it, because I'm going to hurry on. A model of compassion with discernment. First, Paul deals with widows in verses 3 through 16. He talks about being compassionate for widows. There's another one you have to watch out for. He says right off the bat there in verse 3, if you look at it, look what verse 3 says there in chapter 5, I believe. Honor widows that are what? Widows indeed. See, there's a difference between a widow and a widow indeed. Matter of fact, some of our widows that I know could make some of us swim in money. They could fill their pool up with it. They've got more wealth than, than all of us put together. And they're well taken care of, and God's taken care of them, and their husbands have taken care of them, and, and they're well off. That is not, a, they may be a widow where they've lost their mate, but they're not a widow indeed. You see, the scripture's very clear as to our responsibility as a church when it comes to compassion, you see. And with discernment, we're to discern. When a widow comes in here and says, I want this and need this and this, and we find out she's got this and this and owns this and owns half of uh, Marion County, she's not a widow indeed. She may have lost her husband, but he's left her quite well. Hello. (laughs) Same thing for you men. So we learned that, and that's there. Then Paul says, secondly, in verses 17 through 25, he says, secondly, if we're going to be a a church that has compassion with discernment, we must uh, deal with moral responsibility. Moral responsibility. Paul deals with morals and responsibility in verses 17 through 25, as as he gives to us here. Let me give you three of them. The first one here uh, we find in verses 17 and 18. The church has a more, if we're going to be the right thinking, right kind of church, and how to think right about the church, then the church has to have compassion and discernment when it comes to paying the pastor. Hello. Paying a fair salary. You can look at it and see what it says. Now, I know some people scream and skirmish and get all over this. But let's see what God says. Let the elders, that's the pastor, bishop, shepherd, that rule well. So, you know, that's, a, that's a quality that I'm allowed to have according to God. A place of ruling. Are you with me? Deacons don't have that. That's, one, that's that ninth qualification that I'm allowed to have. Be counted worthy of double honor. And especially they who labor in the word. And what else, church? Doctrine. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labor is worthy of his reward. The church has a moral responsibility to take care of the shepherd. And it says if he's the one that does all the teaching and the preaching, he's to be worthy of double honor. Someone asked me, what's double honor? I said, well, I know one church in this city, how they do it, because I was there. They took and had all the men turn in, not their names on it. They put no names on it. They just had them all turn in and ask them, each man, what his gross salary was. All those men turned it in, and then the church divided that by the number of men. 20 men, whatever it was, 20, 30, whoever turned it in. And, and, the, and it came out, the average was $400, so we paid the pastor $800. Wow, that was low. The Bible says he's worthy of double honor. Now, I didn't make the standard of the rule. God did. See, but see, we want to change the standard. But God's standard says, no, no, this is the way it goes. And yet so many people cringe about a pastor making a decent sour to live off of. You ought not have your pastor out here eating beans and rice. Even though there's nothing wrong with it. He ought not be driving some beat-up car 
or living in a shack down by the tracks and driving an old beat up Cadillac. That's not taking care of your shepherd. So thank God here they take care of me. Wow, praise God. I've been taken care of for 14 years. Hallelujah. Started out here even making less than what I made for Dr. Woodward. And I said, whoa, Lord have mercy. And he just barely paid me enough money to buy a bag of groceries each week. And then gave half of it back to him. In the tithes and offer. Ask him. Oh, the preacher makes too much money. But it's okay for you to make a million dollars, but the preacher can't make 10000 See, something wrong with that picture. I'll tell you what, you show me a church that takes care of their shepherd, and I'll show you a church that God takes care of. Guarantee it. You take care of the man of God that God has placed over you. Those of you that are watching and listening. And I tell you what, God will take care of your church. He'll make sure you got everything you need and then some. And all of your needs will be supplied and a whole wealth of leftover to do something else with. If you just simply take care of the man of God and the shepherd that God has placed over you. Quit being stingy. Now our folks, now let me tell you, our church is great. Well, you guys have taken care of us tremendously. Fantastic. And when we've had to back off and slow down and take some away, as soon as they could, they've turned right around and, phew, man, laid it right on us again. We have a good church here, good people. The best. We got the best here. Amen. I'll tell you what. Man, I eat good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Drive two automobiles. Maybe small. <laughs> can't get big people in them like Ted that are 6'6", six, six, but that's all right. Let's midgets can get in them. Hallelujah. You got four tires and motor and they run. Hallelujah. And they don't leak when it rains. And the air conditioning works and the heat works. I'm blessed. And they're paid for. Hallelujah. Oh, God's good. Man, I just want to camp on that for a while. Never mind. All right, notice in verses 19 through 20 real quickly. Here again is another moral responsibility. If we're going to think right about the church, we have a responsibility to confront church leaders when they're doing wrong. When they're doing wrong. Now, that doesn't mean every time you disagree with them. We're talking about when they're doing wrong, and we don't have time to go into all of that. I'm out of time. All right, verses 21 through 25, we're to, do, we're to be doing what is right. Paul said if we're going to be the kind of church, a force, we're, what we're doing is looking at being a force in bad times, we're to do what's right. Amen? Lastly, very quickly, the church is a source to be a source of reliable information. The church is to be a source of reliable information. And let me quickly go down there through them with you because of my time this morning. First of all, A there in your study notes, the church is to be an amplifier of truth. We are to be an amplifier of truth. And if you study chapter 6 now that what we're in is we're taking a survey, you'll find that the Apostle Paul deals with at least seven subjects in this chapter. At least seven subjects that he deals with and tells Timothy the truth of these seven subjects. And he said, here's what you're to teach. You're to teach the truth. The church is to be an amplifier of the truth. We're to amplify truth, sound, biblical doctrine. And that means if we have to tackle issues and so forth and, and, and everything, we must deal with it with the truth and be an amplifier of the truth. And here he talks about them. In verses 1 and 2, he talks about one's occupation. All right, one's occupation. In verse number 3, he talks about doctrinal truths. How important the church has to be an amplifier of the truth of the Word of God, of sound biblical doctrine. That is vitally important. Number three there, he talks about relational conflicts in verses 4 and 5. We need to be an amplifier of the truth concerning relational conflicts. In verses 6 and 8, he talks about personal con contentment. Paul says, I've learned how to be a base. I've learned how to have and not have. But in all states, I've become content. I know how to be content in whatever state that I'm in. We need to deal with that and tell the truth about personal contentment. Then in verses 9 through 11... And verses 17 through 19, Paul deals with the truth about money. He talks about money. And he said we need to be an amplifier of the truth of money. A source of reliable source of truth concerning money. Then in verse number 12, he talks about number 6 there. He says we need to be a source, a reliable source of truth concerning priorities. 
priorities. I'm going to read verse 12 for you. Fight the good fight. That's our priority, church. Fight the good fight of what? Faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Talks about priorities. Then in verses 13 through 16 and 20 through 21, he talks about the prior, uh, he talks about the truth of life itself and a lifestyle. The truth of life and life itself. Look at verse 13. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good, notice some words he's going to talk about and mention here, confession. In verse 12, he talked about professed and profession. Then in verse 14, that thou keep the commandment without spot, unrebukable, uh, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15, which is his times, he shall show who is blessed, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light, which no man can approach, and to whom no man hath seen nor can see, uh, to whom be honor and power and everlasting. Amen. And then he talks about a lifestyle in verses 20 and 21. O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely called, which are some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. You see, we must profess the truth of the gospel. There's a lot of people who've made a lot of professions, but they don't possess salvation. There's a lot of people who've made a profession, but they put the profession in the wrong thing rather than in the faith of Jesus Christ. He talked about professions. He talked about faith. He talked about possessions and, and professions. You see, ladies and gentlemen, have you made a profession today in Jesus Christ? Have you made a good, solid, biblical profession in the Lord Jesus Christ and professed Him as your Lord and Savior? Have you confessed before Him your sin? Have you confessed with your mouth that He is the Lord? Have you confessed that you've sinned against a holy and righteous God? And by faith, you made a profession in Jesus Christ and trusted Him as your Lord and Savior to forgive you of all your sins and to take you to heaven and to glory someday when you die. You see, if you've made that, you've made the right profession and you possess the right salvation because you have the right thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God and salvation that came from a right Bible, from a true doctrine, you see. And all oh, have you made that? And today there's a many that made a profession. Jesus said, matter of fact, many in that day shall say unto me, Lord, Lord. And he also said, not all that say unto me, Lord, Lord. There's the profession. They professed the Lord, Lord. But he said that not all that do that shall enter the kingdom of God, but he that doeth the will of the Father. You know what the will of the Father is? It takes more than just profession. One must profess with their mouth and believe in their heart, you see. Why? Because salvation is, a confession is made unto salvation with the mouth, you see. And the man believeth unto righteousness with the heart. You see, there are many that have professed to know the Lord, but yet Jesus said in that day, many shall say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done works and wonders in your name, and all of this, and Jesus said, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Friend, you better make sure you have the right profession today, and you have professed your faith in none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, who Paul says here, he is the King of kings, he is the Lord of glory, he is the Lord of Lords, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've made your profession in anything else, my friend, you're going to fall short and miss heaven because there's only way, and that's through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you profess today saving salvation? Do you have a saving faith today? Paul ended that up, that whole last six, seven verses about that, and oh, what a beautiful passage of Scripture. And you know where it came from? He said, listen, church, Timothy, you'd better be one of, of sound doctrine and teaching in, in a good force in bad times, because we're living in bad times, and the church had better be that force available, because that's the only way people are going to get saved, is to hear the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have you made that profession today to trust Christ? Have you professed with your mouth and believed in your heart today the Lord Jesus Christ? Those of you that are watching by television right now, those of you that are on the internet watching us, those that are listening on your iPads and iPhones and Facebook and, and tablets that we have out there for you. Friend, have you made the right 
profession today? And do you possess biblical salvation? Have you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and professed Him only and, and, and received Him as your Lord and Savior? If you haven't done that, we want to invite you to do so right now. Heads bowed and eyes are closed here in the auditorium. Those of you that are sitting here as well, listen up because maybe you haven't made that right profession. You may have professed something and in something or something, but have you made the right profession? And do you possess genuine saving salvation today? If you have it, my friend, search your heart and make sure you know the Lord Jesus Christ. Make sure today that if you were to die today, heaven would be your home. There would be no doubt, no question of it because you could honestly say, I have made a right profession today and I possess salvation. I have professed with my mouth the Lord. I have professed that I'm a sinner and sinned against God. And by faith, I have received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior to take me to heaven someday when I die. Friends, that's the only way you're going to make it. And you got to have the right thinking about the church because the church has the right answer. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, those of you that are watching with us now, I want to look here at the camera with me and look into your television there, your screen and your phones, your tablets. We want to offer you the extension to you to come to Christ today right now where you're at by simply professing with your mouth and believing in your heart. You say, what am I to profess? You're to profess that He is the Lord. That's what the Bible tells us to do. So right now, if you would, just simply pray, Dear God, that's right, go ahead. I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord. I confess that I'm a sinner, and I've sinned against you, God, and I ask you to forgive me. I do now, by faith, believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He took my place. He paid my sin debt. I believe he was buried that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And right now by faith, I do call upon him and receive him into my heart and life to be my Lord and my Savior to take me to heaven someday when I die. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. God bless you for those that are watching with us and listening. If you prayed that prayer, God bless you. According to the Bible, you are now a child of God in heaven will be your home one day. God bless you. And I trust you've made the right profession. And I trust those of you that are saved this morning that listen to this will begin to have the right thinking about the church. That's so important. For our folks that are sitting here today, would you stand with us? Here in the auditorium, everyone standing. Just a minute, Brother David's going to come and lead us in a hymn of invitation. If you're here today lost without Christ, never been scripturally saved born again we would invite you to come today and profess Jesus Christ and possess Jesus Christ not only profess it but possess it genuine salvation and come to Christ maybe you prayed with us while just a while ago and invited Jesus into your heart and life why not come and make it public this morning and present yourself publicly today if you're here today you've been saved and you haven't been scripturally baptized why not present your candidate for baptismal to follow our Lord and believers baptism if you're here today and you're looking for a good church home that maybe has helped you today to think right about the church not according to me but according to God's word and what God says they love souls and the word of God and wants to see the world saved for Christ why not come and be a part with us and join with us help us reach our world for Christ Whatever decision that God's laid on your heart, we don't sing very long, just a couple of stanzas. Ask the Spirit of God to move in your heart and life.